Tonight, hydro bill cuts. For too long, governments, my own included, have made mistakes in the way we've structured Ontario's electricity system. That has resulted in rates that are unfairly high. The Wynn government is slashing your hydro bill. By how much, when you can expect it, and is there a catch? Plus, city sued. $53 million. Why a downtown developer is filing a lawsuit against the city in regards to its rapid transit plan. And jackpot denied. You didn't mind taking my money all these years and that, but sooner as there was a, a nice sum, no, you don't want to pay me. A man wins big but can't claim the prize, the reason that dates back 17 years. with Kelda Yoon. Good evening. Well, the City of London is making it clear tonight it intends to fight. As we reported at 6, a $53 million lawsuit was filed against the city by a developer who says his high-rise development would be permanently and negatively impacted by the proposed bus rapid transit routes. The developer has since put the project on hold, but tonight, in response to our story at 6, a city lawyer told council a statement of defense will be filed soon. But it is under review, um, and that review is not completed. Uh, obviously, we need to meet with staff and uh, uh, begin preparation to uh, file a statement of defense. Our Daryl Newcomb has more in this CTV exclusive. $53 million. Downtown commercial real estate expert George Georgopoulos reacts to being shown the statement of claim filed by Danforth London Limited against London City Hall. A year ago, CTV News was first to report that Danforth had withdrawn its application to build several high-rises on the site of this parking lot at King and Clarence because City Hall could not confirm how much of the property would be needed for rapid transit stops. Georgeopolis is not involved in the lawsuit but knows the property's owner. He spent uh, just under $9 million buying that piece of real estate, ready to put up two or three towers up there that were really going to help uh, invigorate that part of the city. The statement of claim suggests that plans for dedicated traffic lanes and bus stops for rapid transit have impacted the property's ability to be developed because City Hall wants a five-meter strip of land along both street fronts. Proposed changes to the traffic on King Street and Clarence Street made access to the property so difficult as to make the property near inaccessible to automobiles. London's rapid transit plan has two routes, one that runs from the north in an L shape out to the east end, and a second seven-shaped route that runs from the west to the south. Where those two routes meet, and where presumably lots of Londoners will be transferring, is here at the corner of King and Clarence. Danforth proposed four buildings on the site, three apartment buildings, 35 stories, 32 stories, and 19 stories high and a four-story office building fronting onto Dundas. The lawsuit claims were it not for City Hall delays, construction could have started last year. The $53 million claim represents damages on the basis of negligence and on the basis of a failure to act fairly and in good faith. The lawsuit was filed on February 22nd. City Hall has yet to respond with a statement of defense. The city solicitor telling me by email today he's not in a position to comment on the lawsuit. Georgeopolis believes a lawsuit of this magnitude could motivate council to change the rapid transit routes. And based on conversations he's had with other landowners downtown, it may not be the only legal action. We've got to look at this thing again with the disruption that's going to happen to our key taxpayers. And those are a lot of the business people. None of the allegations in the statement of claim have been proven in court. Daryl Newcomb, CTV News. And downtown business owners are also airing their frustrations with the city's rapid transit plan. As Brian Bicknell reports, they say there has been a lack of communication and are urging downtown London to withdraw support of the project. 
pounding the pavement so they can save their streets. Well, that this is crazy. That it, it, it's a it's actual quote unquote. It's a joke uh, that we need a billion dollar transit system in London. And and it's funny. Everybody says we're not Toronto, uh, which is true. We don't have the population. We are not moving that many people throughout the city. A petition is being circulated among downtown merchants calling on downtown London to withdraw support of rapid transit, saying they haven't been kept in the loop. As a group, we just feel we, uh, a thousand businesses in the BIA, that we haven't been properly consulted um, about this construction plan and the rapid transit. The construction will absolutely kill 90% of the businesses and therefore we will have no more downtown. The general manager of downtown says the BRT represents progress and they're not about to stand in the way. Communication is available and we're happy to talk to them individually as a group and however they want to do it. So I have not had a phone call or an email from any of our members. The BRT revolt is playing out as city council attempts to secure hundreds of millions in funding from the feds and the province. The head of the BRT working group at City Hall admits this doesn't look good. Councillor Phil Squire says they have to do a better job of communicating. I think if we don't get out there and consult and satisfy everyone that we're doing our best in that area, I think it jeopardizes the credibility of the entire project because when I hear uh, that important and, and crucial business people are not aware of what the city's doing, I think that's a problem. Brian Bicknell, CTV News. Well, tonight, City Council held a rare Thursday meeting. On the agenda, what to do about a pair of green spaces vying to be named Vimy Ridge Park. Despite concerns raised by an agitated Bill Armstrong, they decided to allow the site next to the Charlie Fox roundabout to bear the name temporarily. I trusted the committee was doing the right thing, and I didn't speak to this issue. Waited a long time. Staff is going to come back, and we'll expect them to... Pick the best park that's available. And I, I, I'm sorry, but there's no intention on my part to, to think this temporary is going to turn into a permanent. The existing property on Trafalgar Road may be required for the province's high-speed rail project, but it will bear the name Vimy Ridge Park while city staff review all possible sites, including an East End Park supported by Armstrong. Other councillors suggested the Parkwood Hospital grounds. The search for the best location will take six to eight months and miss the, the 100th anniversary of the battle in April. I think it's a, a, a good first step, and I think that... Uh, It'll give them, give them a chance to see what can happen there on, on the Memorial Day of Vimy Ridge. Right now, the city has spent zero dollars on this beautiful site. Any other site will cost certainly hundreds, especially if it's a new one, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, the Catholic School Board's championship hockey game broke down into a brawl among student fans tonight. There were two separate outbreaks in the stands. This one happened after the game between St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Andre Bissette. Now, besides the scuffling, water bottles were thrown by some high school students. The dust-up also spread outside Thompson Arena on the western campus. The campus police were called and at least two ambulances were summoned, but no word tonight on any injuries. Well, too much, too little, or too late. The provincial government has announced an average 17% cut in hydro rates for Ontario consumers. But is this actually short-term gain for long-term pain? And is the cut enough to remove the issue from the opposition party's election platforms? CTV's Paul Bliss takes a look. It's the largest hydro bill reduction in Ontario history. It may also determine whether the Kathleen Wynne government survives next year's election. For too long, governments, my own included, have made mistakes in the way we've structured Ontario's electricity system. That has resulted in rates that are unfairly high. It's time to fix those mistakes in ways that work for today and for the future. The Premier says electricity is not a frill, it's an essential. So she plans to lower bills this year 25% for those in cities, up to 53% in rural and northern Ontario. A $135 monthly bill will drop to $101 starting June 1st. And there's savings of $12 to $75 a month for 800,000 customers, up from 350,000 in rural areas. Not just another short-term stopgap, but something that's sound, 
and sustainable. The energy minister says rural customers are getting added relief. Downtown Toronto, downtown Sudbury, downtown London, you have 500 people on one pole. In the rural parts of our province, you have a 500 poles to get to one person. They have been paying a higher proportion on their distribution rate. Here's some of how prices are being cut for people. Electricity price increases will be held to the rate of inflation for four years. They'll be stretching the global adjustment payments over 30 years, not 20, to ease short-term costs. This will add $1.4 billion a year in interest costs. They're simply mortgaging our kids' and our grandkids' future to the tune of $172 billion to pay for their mistakes. It looks like we're talking in the tens of billions of dollars to buy down hydro rates in advance of the election. The opposition says it's a Hail Mary pass designed to get the Liberals re-elected, the Premier insisting it's about fairness, not political fortunes. Paul Bliss, CTV News. Well, when the theory of Moneyball was put forth years ago, it changed how teams looked at baseball data. Well, now a similar analysis is being used to catch impaired drivers. Our Merrick Sutherland has more. It's about getting things down to one number, using stats the way we read them will find value in players that nobody else can see. The Oakland Athletics changed the face of baseball and all of sports by how they decided to look at data. The Elgin Detachment of the OPP are using that same philosophy when it comes to crime data. We need to use our resources more efficiently. The uh, random patrol is not going to be an effective use of that, hence the reason why we're using analytics to uh, be a more innovative and productive use of our uh, policing resources. In 2017, Elgin OPP have arrested nine people for impaired driving. Six of those arrests came from using analytics. The data that it was used would have been in all the previous impaired from before, previous impaired drivers from before. So they would just collect that data and then sort of narrow it down so we have a more efficient use of our resources. Bell Media Tech analyst Carmi Levy uses analytics every day. And in the past few years, it has become a necessity for all industries. You cannot find a field, a sector, uh, an area of expertise w that does not rely on data now. Everything is data-driven in 2017. And the OPP says this type of focused patrols will be expanding into other areas. It can be used for things like vehicle entries. It can be used things for traffic complaints. It's just not impaired driving. This is just one of the examples that has been successful within Elgin. How the analytics is viewed is evolving day to day according to the OPP and also changes how they collect data from crimes now in the hopes of becoming more efficient and effective. Merrick Sutherland, CTV News. Still ahead on CTV News. He won big at the slots but couldn't collect the money and it was his own fault. We'll explain what happened. Look out, dirty floors. There's a new sheriff in town. Now Swiffer Wet Jet cleans the toughest messes like never before with our new Absorb and Lock Pad. Yeehaw. Yesterday, stock markets began to correct themselves today. In Toronto, the TSX fell by 63 points, while in New York, the Dow fell 112, while the Nasdaq dropped 42. The Canadian dollar was off by 36 hundredths of a cent to 74.63. Gold fell by 17.10 an ounce, while oil dropped by 122 a barrel. Well, it is another nail in the coffin of a brick-and-mortar retail. Ongoing sale declines have prompted Abercrombie & Fitch to close more stores in the U.S. At this time, 60 stores are on the chopping block. The closure has followed the closure of 53 domestic stores last year, and they likely won't be the last. Half of the company's more than 700 U.S. leases are up for renewal by the end of fiscal year 2018, giving the company flexibility to exit more more locations. Abercrombie and Fitch has closed hundreds of its stores over the past five years. 
Well, imagine the elation of hitting a jackpot at the casino, but then being denied the payout. It happened to one Toronto area man, and as CTV's Pat Foran explains, it was due to a decision he made 17 years ago and had forgotten about. 82-year-old John Mirando thought he recently had some great luck. He won a jackpot while playing a slot machine at the Mohawk racetrack outside of Milton. I thought, when's it going to stop, eh? Anyway, it stopped at $10,002. Mirando won $1,000 twice on a black and white $2 coin slot machine and was paid his winnings. But when he won $10,000 on the same machine, he was taken in a room, told he couldn't have the jackpot, and was escorted off the property. Mirando says he only started gambling about 20 years ago because he was bored after his wife died and he had retired from being a Brinks driver. When he felt he was spending too much, 17 years ago he signed a form to self-exclude himself from gaming facilities, something he says he forgot. Well, I said I'm 17 years older. I've had a brain operation. Ontario Lottery and Gaming says to help problem gamblers, a new rule came into effect last September. It states, as part of our support of a self-excluder's commitment to stop gambling, self-excluded individuals are not permitted to win prizes. Any jackpot over $10,000 is reviewed. OLG says because Mirando is still considered self-excluded, he can't have the money. People who are self-excluded um, need to know that Prizes will be disentitled if they're detected at a gaming facility, and this is part of our supports to them, part of our way of helping them live up to their commitment to themselves to stay away from gambling. There is a process to return to gambling if you're self-excluded. Mirando says he didn't know about the rule and calls it unfair. He didn't mind taking my money on these years and that, but sooner as there was a, a nice sum, no, you don't want to pay me. Pat Foran, CTV News. Let's go to Julie now in the Weather Center with the first look at the forecast. How's it looking, Julie? It's cold out there tonight in Caldo. Wind chills from minus 10 to minus 15. We have some flurries in the forecast for tomorrow. Two to four centimeters in parts of midwestern Ontario. Five centimeters. Still the risk for snow squalls developing. Milder air mass moving in for everyone on Sunday and the chance for showers as we kick off a brand new week. I'll have your first weekend of March forecast coming up on the other side of the break. This GE Cafe fridge is a world first. It gives you cold water, hot water, and... Coffee? French roast. It's French roast? Mm -hmm. Upgrade for less with top brand appliances at great prices. The Home Depot. More saving, more doing. Well, Julie, yeah, freezing out there tonight. I had to bundle up. Yeah, and mitts and hat Everything. and the whole shebang. Yeah. We need our winter coats back out. I sent my kids to school this morning, snow pants in hand. They didn't want to wear them, but they put them in their backpacks, and they had them out at recess. Minus 4, the high temperature today. Minus 7, the low, comparing that with what's normal for this time of year. It was a struggle for our high temperature. That minus 4 was reached at midnight. And during the day in London, between minus five and minus seven. Let's take a look at this radar tonight. We've had some light flurries moving through Essex County as well as Chatham Kent, Sarnia Lambton. So some spotty flurries, don't expect anything heavy, but some flurries in the air, of course, create some slick road conditions. So keep that in mind as you head out to overnight and early tomorrow morning. We have a weak low pressure system. It's ejecting out of Missouri right now into Indiana and Illinois. And you can see just off to the south, a bit of moisture with that. Significant lake effect snow in Lake Michigan over the Upper Peninsula today. They were digging out as streamers moved off the lake. For us, we've had flurries and we'll have some more light flurries heading into tomorrow morning. Now overnight, we should hold fairly steady at that minus seven. Outside right now though, feels like minus 12 with that wind chill. So waking up tomorrow morning to minus six, still dealing with a wind chill first thing in the morning. By midday, minus five. So northwest winds from 15 to 20 kilometers per hour. It's not going to warm up much tomorrow. 
It'll be the coldest day over the next seven. So that weak little wave off to the south will create enough instability for some lake effect snow once again to generate off Lake Huron. High pressure building in and this high will bring us lots of sunshine though as we head into Saturday. So tomorrow's tricky forecast in terms of uh, where these bands will be setting up off Lake Huron. So watch as I take you through the next 24. So we have this little wave that's coming across Lake Huron overnight through Gray Bruce County and then tomorrow morning you can see just north of London so areas like Lucan Exeter will be picking up some snowfall tomorrow morning that's at 7 a.m. that drops into London right into the core of the city at 8 and that'll continue through mid morning then that that little band will slowly start to migrate off to the northeast here on in Perth tomorrow evening could see some heavier amounts of snow develop possibility of 5 to 8 centimeters tomorrow night so minus 5 the high tomorrow in London 2 to 4 centimeters of snowfall some light snow in the morning, then becoming a mix of sun and cloud, possibility of some light flurries in the afternoon. Saturday, beautiful sunny skies, but still on the chilly side, but great to be outside, minus three. We'll take it to five degrees on Sunday. We have some light rain, but milder temperatures in the forecast on Monday and Tuesday, a bit of a dip on Wednesday. And then Thursday, slowly starting to see uh, more stable conditions. Midwestern Ontario, minus six, the high tomorrow. Again, five centimeters, but the potential for snow squalls. So some areas will pick up five centimeters overnight. And then another five tomorrow, minus four for the high on Saturday. Milder air rolling in Sunday, but the possibility of some mixed precipitation heading into Sunday night. Monday, we have rain in the forecast. That'll carry us into Tuesday. And then another cold push, rather, on Wednesday. Kelda. All right, thanks so much, Julie. Well, the Chatham-Kent Police Service is once again offering its Citizens Police Academy program. The academy consists of 12 classes that are held every Wednesday night. Now, those who take part will learn the ins and outs of police work, including going on tours of police headquarters and the Chatham-Kent Courthouse. Now, it should be noted that the program is not intended in any way to train people to become police officers, but to shine a positive light on the work being done by officers in our region education is key and sometimes the public has a lot of questions as to why we do things and I think when they have an opportunity and part of the Citizens Police Academy is going for a ride along with a constable on the street or a sergeant and that uh, gives them the experience to really learn what our job entails. The seesaw pattern continues with record-breaking warmth followed by a blast of cold. We are skiing into March despite the warmth and heavy rainfall. A return to winter-like weather today with wind chills from minus 12 to minus 15. Tonight will be an awesome night to make snow and resorts will be taking advantage of the colder air over the next couple of days. Friday will be the coldest over the next seven. Snowmaking will continue as resorts recover from the mild temperatures. The high Friday, minus 5 with flurries. Sunshine on tap for Saturday with a high of minus 2. You can still ski machine groom granular at 16 Alpine resorts in Ontario. Bowler has 8 of 15 runs open and a base of 35 centimeters. Most cross-country resorts are closed in the province with the exception of hardwood bike and ski and horseshoe Nordic. The countdown is on to the March break. Snowmaking equipment will take advantage of this brief cold spell. Get out and enjoy the season. The spring equinox is just 18 days away.
back. Sports time. Five points separated the Hounds and the Spitfires headed into their big showdown at beautiful WFCU Center. What an odd game, too. The Spits all over the first portion of play into the second. Gabe Velarde scores from the impossible angle, his 25th. 3-0 Windsor. How did that get in? It did, and Windsor was up. But in the third period, all Greyhounds. Three straight goals. The equalizer from Jack Opaka, his 27th. This ball game tied at three. They'd end up going to overtime, and Windsor wasn't going out like that. Graham not around everybody. Spectacular. What a goal. The Spitfires win 4-3, gaining two important points on the Sioux. Post game now from the Rose City. Huge. Um, you know, every game of... Uh... No countdown of these last few are, are huge, and uh, you know we need every single point that we can get. I loved our game. I thought we played a, a really good game against a very good opponent. Um, and, and the hard part was the fact that we gave up those three goals. That is so tough uh, to rebound uh, from. It's huge moving forward. You know the Sioux is a good team, and uh, obviously we're trying to catch them. And uh, you know we got a limited amount of games coming up, so you know right now we're trying to play our best hockey because we're getting ready to go into playoffs. So it's looking good right now. Tough up 4-3 in the third until Nick Suzuki scores his 36th of the season, second of the game, ties things at four. They go to overtime where anything can happen. And uh, this is how it went down. Matt Spencer delivers a loose puck by Michael McNiven. And that would end her. 4-3 Pete's the attack, get the point. One back of third place, London in the West. From the Junior B playoffs, Chatham 1-0 over St. Thomas. Leamington beats Sarnia 4-3. What a sight. Tears streaked down P.K. Subban's cheeks at Sandra Bell. The former Habs D-man got a long-standing ovation in his first game back in Montreal. He would assist on a Ryan Ellis goal, and uh, the Preds would go up. But the Canadians stormed back in the third. Brendan Gallagher would tie it. Then Paul Byron on a breakaway. Nine seconds left, and he scores. Wow, drama big time. 2-1 Habs. Leafs Kings going on right now. 2-1. nothing. Toronto High School Hockey Champions crowned in the Forest City. Game three for the Catholic title between St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Andre Bissette. The winner moving on to Wassa Monday. The top-seeded Flames dominated from the opening face-off, taking a 2-0 lead after the first two frames. In the third, they'd add a pair of goals and seal the deal. 5-0. Darcy Bolton, the shutout for the Flames, who win the district championship for a third straight season. Well, it's our third time in a row, so it's obviously SCA tradition now. It's a great program, and we're just carrying on the tradition. We just had to get back to our team effort and play SCA hockey. I thought we played as a team more today, passed the puck, got pucks on net, and obviously scored more goals. With uh, last year's off the run, um, it, was, uh, it was awesome and a great experience. And I think uh, this year we're really prepared, and uh, we'll be ready to go for Wausau and then hopefully Offsa. There was also a deciding game in the public league between Oak Ridge and Lucas. The Vikings were led by a pair of big performances in a 5-1 victory playoff MVP Ryan Moore had a goal, a goal and three assists Levi Seyu scored three times the Vikings will be the top seed Monday when they head to Elmer for Wassa good luck to all involved and finally he's got to be one of the favorites to win NBLC MVP he's a man who looks like he belongs at another level Royce White is dominating the NBL of Canada with a record four triple doubles in 21 games the numbers are staggering. 18 points a game, 10 boards, 6 assists. We've just been talking as a team about me being more aggressive on the block and, and establishing the wood. We call it the wood and, and making sure that um, we're establishing that paint presence. He's becoming a force that no one in this league can handle. And he's showing why NBA teams were so high on his skill set. It's tough for him out here because, you know... He's so big and he's so strong and he's so he's so versatile that you know the, the teams really you know they hit him hard they they foul him and he's that's an adjustment within itself for him that's part of his development. Anyone that's watched an NBL game will notice right away how physical it can get on the low block. Both the offense and defensive guys banging away. And that's something that newcomers just have to adjust to. And just trying to gauge, you know, it's, it's not only my, my strength in getting banged on when I'm on offense, but how much I can bang when I'm on defense. And uh, it's an adjustment, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, as long as the team's winning, um, I'm totally satisfied with that. And right now the team is winning and winning and winning. 14 in a row. It's no surprise that since Royce got fit, he's changed the look of the NBL standings. Brent Lale, 
CTV News. The Spitfire's big winners in overtime. Check the website for more sports. That's going to do it for our show. Have a great one.